Sometimes in the world of e-commerce, we forget that we actually have to sell products. We throw listings up, assume they're gonna sell themselves, and they don't. Today's guest is an expert in selling, and he's going to take his massive amount of experience and put it in a concept and kind of some, some general ideas that we as e-commerce sellers can understand, but oftentimes forget to use. It's gonna be a good episode. Listen to the end, here we go. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the AMPM Podcast. I'm your host, Tim Jordan, and today we are talking about selling. Now, normally in the e-commerce world, when we talk about selling, we're talking about optimizing our PPC ads, or we're talking about getting on another sales channel. But one of the things that we frequently forget about is we have to cause a consumer to make a decision. We have to get them to actually decide to purchase this product, right? And a lot of times, we don't think about the psychology or the process or the branding or any of those things that go into it. So we have one of the, I guess it's safe to say, top producing salesmen, if that's the, the appropriate way to say it, in uh, the country, maybe the world, who's going to share some of his experience. So welcome to the podcast, Jeremy Miner. Well, there you go, Tim. Uh, thanks for all the uh, the nice uh, words and accolades. My kids say I'm pretty boring, so I'm going to take all that as a compliment. Thank you. It's good to be on your show, man. I've, I've actually listened to some of your shows here the last couple of weeks, and well done. You're giving a lot of value. People are learning things to help their businesses. So uh, you just ask away and I'll, I'll do my best to, to help these people listening in. Cool. So I want to uh, first talk about kind of your background because understanding what somebody's expertise is gives a little bit of credibility to sometimes the crazy ideas that we throw up, but also gives a little bit of perspective into why you see the world the way that you do. Now, when I started this off, I said that you were one of the highest producing selling guys around. And the stat I have here from the Direct Telling Association is you were listed as the 45th highest earner in what the country is actually the world. So that's by the direct selling association. So it's an international ranking of the highest, the top highest paid producing salespeople in any industry. So you're talking, you know, you're talking a few hundred million salespeople in any industry. Um, so I held that ranking. I was number 45 in the world back in my sales career for about seven years straight uh, before I, I pretty much semi-retired. And then a year later, about three years ago, started seventh level as a sales training organization. That's amazing. So seventh stuff. level. Yeah, really boring. So seventh level is an organization that I know you work with some of the, the biggest companies out there. You work with Google AdWords. You said you work with Kia Motors. You work with some of the biggest, um, you know, thought leaders in, in especially the digital marketing space and things like that, which I assume gives you a lot of experience in what we're going to be talking about today, right? We do. Yeah, supposedly we do. I mean, we, you know, like one of our biggest clients is Ryan Serhant, uh, the, the star of Million Dollar List in New York. We train his salespeople that sell like his coaching program that teach people how to, you know, brand themselves as real estate agents with more social media followers. You know, we train people like Josh Crisp, you know, Joshua Crisp, like big Amazon, you know, SBA program. So we train a lot of people in the e-commerce space, but it's all over. I mean, we train over 140 some industries at this point for sure. And I find that interesting, you know, over 147 industries, you said, I assumed, I guess I've, I've always assumed that every industry needs its own type of selling, like it's all done differently. But is there a set of generally known and understood principles yeah. that apply to all industries? Yeah, well, I mean, the reason why we've been able to duplicate those results in any industry we train, like we just, you know, the other day I noticed we train, we hired, we got on board a huge seatbelt manufacturer out of Berlin, Germany that sells seatbelts to like Range Rover and BMW and Rolls Royce. I mean, I never even thought that seatbelts need to be sold, but apparently they do, right? So our process is all about like from A to Z, like connecting questions to situation. How do we connect with the buyer? Okay. If you've got a sales team listening to right now, how does your process, how do, how do you, your salespeople, you know, connect with your buyer, take the focus off of them in the beginning of that call or conversation and put it on them. Then we move into like situation questions. How do we find out what their current situation really is? And a lot of this has to do with marketing too and branding. We teach a lot of this in, in our courses and that. And then we move into problem awareness questions. How do we help the prospect realize they even have a problem? Because most people don't realize they have a problem when you first start talking to them, or maybe they don't understand how bad the problem really is, or maybe they don't understand the consequences of what happened if they don't do anything about solving the problems. Now, through your advanced questioning, once you learn those skills and it doesn't matter the industry, not only are you able, and this could be even ad copy too, not only are you able to help them find that they have one problem, 
but now you're able to help them see in their mind that they have two, three, or four other problems that they didn't even think they had. And when you're able to get the prospect to start viewing it that way, you're not telling them what their problems are because that's going to go in one ear out the other because you're biased, right? You're trying to sell them something. But the questions you're asking them are allowing them for them to see what those real problems are, okay? And how those problems are affecting them. When they see that from your questioning, they start to view you differently. They start to view you not as some, you know, salesperson that's just trying to stuff your solution down your throat. They start to view you as more of the expert or like the trusted authority who's going to get them the results they want. So we teach a process from connecting questions to situation, to problem awareness, to solution awareness questions, to consequence questions. Like what are the consequences if they don't do anything about changing their situation, right? Like what happens in, what are the ramifications? All the way to how do you package that into a presentation that emotionally connects instead of just boring them? And how do we get them to commit to take the next step and actually purchase what we're offering? So we take that sales structure and we can go to a company like Google AdWords and train the four biggest divisions. We got them a 244% increase in sales in the first quarter when we came in. Okay. They've never seen that. They had to audit, they audited the results four times because they didn't believe it actually, which is crazy. I thought we'd actually do better for them. I was disappointed. And then we can go over to Kia Motors. We can go over to like, you know, a guy like Joshua Crisp and like sell his, his Amazon SBA stuff, teaches people how to do that. So we can take that structure in any industry and get duplicatable results. As far as we know, we're the only company that's been able to do that. So I don't know. We're bragging a little bit now. So it sounds great, right? <laughs> like I'm picking up what you're putting down. I'm buying it. Sure. But awesome. is it relevant to e-commerce sellers, right? Like why does the ability to sell matter? Why do we need to know how to sell as we're selling a physical product? Yeah. Probably not face-to-face. -face. Well, think about it. If you're an e-commerce seller, do you have meetings? where you're trying to persuade maybe a certain media buyer to take you on? Do you have meetings with like, you know, your manufacturer where you're trying to negotiate down? I mean, we're all in sales now, right? It doesn't matter what we do. Like, even if you don't get paid a commission, okay? If you don't get paid a commission, what are you out there trying to do? You're still trying to persuade. You're trying to influence. You're trying to convince. You're trying to move others. We even have a name called non-sale selling. So you're actually practicing a non-sales selling. So let me give you an example. If you're an e-commerce business owner, okay, and you're trying to get your employees to follow your vision of where you want to take your company, well, what are you doing, right? You're trying to persuade, you're trying to influence, you're trying to move others. If you're an employee, let's say that you're an employee listening to this. I don't know, maybe you have some employees on here. You're trying to convince the boss to give you a pay raise. Well, what are you trying to do? You're trying to persuade, you're trying to convince, you're trying to move others. If you're a freaking attorney, trying to convince the jury that your client's innocent, what are you doing? You're trying to influence, you're trying to persuade. I mean, hell, everybody talks about politics now. If you're a politician trying to get people to vote for you, what are you doing? You're trying to persuade, influence. You've got kids, you're trying to get them to do their homework. You are trying to persuade influence. So it doesn't matter what you do. You're an e-commerce business owner, you're in meetings, you're trying to persuade people and move them to do what you want them to do to get better deals. I hate to tell you, but you're in sales. I was in a one of my mastermind meetings last night, actually, and one of my students was asking me about, you know, the, the long term game plan, which I believe in e-commerce. Not every product needs a brand, right? Sometimes you just throw small products up, you make some money, you move on. You don't create like a whole brand presence around it. He said, well, if we're trying to build a business to sell, shouldn't we have a brand? And I said, wait, your business isn't the product. Your business is bigger than that. Maybe your business is a bunch of unbranded products until you find the ones that are. So what you're saying is, is resonating with me from that recent conversation. We sometimes as e-commerce business owners, I say we, like, like our, our tribe of e-commerce sellers, think that what we're doing is we're trying to get someone to buy a product. When it's actually bigger than that, you're right. We're trying to negotiate with suppliers. We're trying to build a team. We're trying to work strategic partnerships. We're trying to uh, convince our clearing agent to prioritize our paperwork, to get our container out of the port faster. Everything that we do in business is much larger than just what we think the public perceived yeah. goal is, yeah. which is to sell more products in a given day. It's all about, and I've never thought about it. It's all about That's influence huge. and persuasion. We are literally every day of the week, every hour. I mean, anytime you're in a meeting, you are literally trying to persuade people to do things for you. Yeah. And I think, you know, kind of leading into that, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. I, I think one of the biggest myths out there that entrepreneurs believe in, and let's, let's talk about branding. Let's talk about like, 
how you're perceived in the marketplace is they feel that if they have this great product or they have these great products that just people are just going to line up and want to buy them. And we call, we actually call that, we have a term in seventh level called product pushing. So we call those product pushers, right? So here's what we have to understand in the marketplace, especially today, especially after the collapse of, you know, Wall Street and, and the, you know, the great uh, recession in 2008, 2009, and especially now with COVID and all that stuff, your prospects are even more cautious and skeptical about making the wrong buying choices than they have ever been before. And why is that? You know, one of the one of our clients, his name is Brandon Kane. I don't know if you're familiar with Brandon, but he's the author of, he's a big social media influencer. He does like Taylor Swift's account, Rihanna's MTV. So he's like this big Hollywood influencer as, as far as like, he has a company that teaches business owners how to scale their social media as far as like getting followers on IG, Facebook, all those, TikTok, all that stuff. And in his book, uh, Hook Point, How to Stand Out in a Three Second World, okay? He says, and I'm quoting him right now, I actually took this note down, I want to bring this up. He says there are over 3 billion content creators every day trying to attract your prospects away from what you're doing, okay? So if you're in e-commerce and you're advertising out there, well, guess what? There's over 3 billion other content creators that are trying to take the attention away from the people that you're trying to get to buy your products. You are even competing with 13-year-old teenagers on TikTok at this point. Now, guess how many content creators there were 20 years ago? Take a wild guess. 10,000. There was a million, which I thought I was like, wow, there was a million. So oh, we've went more from, thought, but that's still fractional <laughs> compared yeah. to. We went today. from 1 million to over 3 billion. Okay. And that's because of the information age that we live in today. We live with the, the power of the internet, especially social media. You have to realize that your prospects are being sold to. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, month after month, year after year. So they build up this like defensive wall, like these mechanisms that certain things you say, maybe in your ad copy, or if you've got a salesperson, certain things they say trigger sales resistance. And I want you to think about that because when I bring this up at events, people are like, oh no, I don't get sold to all the time. Like I'm not on sales calls all the day. I'm like, oh really? Maybe you're not thinking about it, but subconsciously you are because when you wake up in the morning, what's the first thing you do? You grab your phone, you check Facebook or IG, and you see ads trying to sell you something, right? You go into the kitchen, you're like, oh my gosh, like I'm so, I'm so tired. I gotta, maybe if you're an e-commerce seller, you're working from your home office, but you go in to get the coffee, you turn on the TV, and what do you see? Commercials trying to sell you something. You get in the car because you're like, oh man, I gotta go down to my office or whatever. I gotta go to the grocery store, and you turn on the radio, and what do you hear? Ads trying to sell you something. You get home for lunch, you start eating lunch, then you get back on social media and you notice that uh, Aunt Jane is trying to pitch her newest, greatest MLM you should join. Somebody trying to sell you something. You get back in the car to go to dinner, you drive down the road, you see a billboards on the side of the road doing what? Trying to sell you something. We are constantly being sold all of the time, 24 hours a day, because we have to realize that. So as a business owner or a coach or whoever you are, a salesperson, you have to really start to understand that we have to amplify our persuasion ability or we just get left behind in life. We have to be called, we have to become what we call problem finders and problem solvers not product pushers. And that can be in your ad copy, that can be in your ads, it can be on the phone. If you've got a sales team, it doesn't matter. Now, I want everybody to grab a piece of paper, unless you're driving down the road, don't run over anybody or anything. And I want you to think about, and write down these questions. If, you, if, you don't, if you're driving, just kind of remember this in your mind. First question I have for you is, do your prospects have problems? Now, does everybody here that's listening, do your prospects actually have problems? I'm assuming they do, right? Because Every product or service that's ever been made solves a problem, right? Otherwise, there's no product or service that's made, okay? Now, I want you to write down two of the biggest problems that your product or service, whatever you sell, actually solves. So, what are And let me pause you for a second, too, because I think that a lot of our listeners right now, as they're going through this exercise, are thinking, well, my products don't solve a problem. It's not a joint ink cream. It's not an or or orthotic shoe insert. It's not Rogaine. But some of the most successful like e-commerce products solve the problem of, I wish I was cooler, right? Like, why do people wear Rolodex or uh, Rolexes? They don't wear a Rolex because they need to know what the time is. They wear a Rolodex because they're trying to convince themselves or everybody else that they're... Do you know, do you know what problem that solves? It solves an emotional need. 
Okay, there's yes. products that solve emotional needs. So like, let's say we train a big um, exotic car dealership, okay? And I remember coming in, this was a couple years ago when we were newer and they're like, wait, man, like, dude, like people, like the manager was like, yeah, I mean, these cars, four or 500,000 Rolls Royce, Bentley, like, dude, people, only rich people come in here. They don't have any problems. They just, they like the car, they buy it. I'm like, oh, really? Let me tell you a little bit of a story. And this was a few years before when I had retired. I said, you know what? When I re- was about to retire, I actually bought a really expensive Maserati. It was like 190000 It was like the most expensive car I'd ever bought, you know? And I'm like, do you know why I bought that car? He's like, no, why did you buy it? I'm like, well, it wasn't, get to, it wasn't from get, getting up and going from point A to point B because I could have just bought like a used Toyota for that, right? Do you know why I bought that car? Because when I was a kid, my parents, my dad lost his job, became disabled, and we went from a middle-class family to being poor. And I remember as a 12 year old going into baseball practice. And instead of the Nike cleats that I always had on, my parents had to buy me cleats from Walmart and everybody made fun of me. And as a 12 year old, I remember thinking in my mind, I'm never going to be poor. Like I have to prove everybody wrong. And it just drove me for so many years to have success and out learn everybody that when I finally got to that level, I'm like, I need my neighbors to know of my status. I need to know my family. I've succeeded. That car was part of solving an emotional need. And like, when I said that, they're like, jaws just dropped. It was like, they had a revelation. They're like, so you're telling me that people buy a $400,000 car for an emotion? I'm like, yeah, because they want to be seen as successful because it doesn't solve a problem of going to the grocery store to home. You could buy a freaking, you know, ski on or whatever they're called. You could buy a $10,000 car. It solves an emotional need. So any product or service that has ever been made or invented solves an emotional need. Like we, I'll give you an example of another emotional need. So we won uh, Inc. 5,000 fastest growing companies in 2021. Okay. We were ranked. So they rank, you know, they ranked the top 5,000 fastest growing companies in the U.S. We were ranked like 1,232, but we were ranked number one fastest sales training company in the United States. So what did we do to solve an emotional need with my other business owner and our employees? We went and bought all these cool plaques from them. And we bought all these like cool pictures and we spent like 15 grand on all that stuff. Now, do we need all that stuff? No, but it solved an emotional need because we wanted our clients when they came into one of our buildings to see that we were very successful. See, I mean, you wouldn't think a picture would solve an emotional need with an award on it, but it does. And that's why we're willing to pay that much. So any product or service that's ever been sold solves something. So let's go back into that. So I I like that you brought that that up. That was, that was the question. Do your prospects have problems? Do your potential clients, do your potential buyers have a problem? Everybody has a problem. Doesn't matter what you sell. Okay. That's why they click on your ad or anything. There's something there like, Oh, I I need that because it's going to do this for me or that, or it's going to get me this. Okay. They're either moving away from pain or they want something better. Those are the two things right now. With those two problems, does your, ask yourself, I look at the two problems on my piece of paper. Does my solution solve those two things? Now, everybody, when I ask that in an audience, doesn't matter the industry, they raise their hand. Okay. So if your prospects have problems, your solution solves those, then why is everybody not buying from you? Okay. So I, what, I always ask salespeople that especially. Okay. So if you're a business owner here and you've got salespeople, why are those people not actually buying from those people? And when I always hear people are like, oh, well, you know, we need to get our salespeople to have a better mindset or we need to have them journal more. Or like we need to bring them to more personal development events. I'm like, you know what? Has nothing to do with any of that. It's not your leads. It's not that you don't meditate enough. It doesn't, it doesn't matter if you get up at four in the morning or, or listen to enough Tony Robbins, even though I love Tony Robbins, or you don't work hard enough. Everybody works hard. It's what you are saying, even in your ads, or if you're, you know, have salespeople, it's what they're saying on the phone or on Zoom or whatever. And it's most importantly, what you're not asking that's triggering your prospects to run the other way. Okay. See, in our day and age, like I was talking about, we have to be, we have to look at ourselves in our branding in our marketing, in our sales, we have to view ourselves as problem finders and problem solvers. Okay. It's not even enough in our day and age to be good at problem solving. Like there's a bunch of sales books back here on this bookshelf. They all say you have to be great at problem solving, but the problem is if they don't buy from you, you can't really solve their problems in our day and age. And even in your marketing and branding, you have to be better at problem finding. Okay. And what that means is you're helping prospects realize that they actually have a problem in the first place, okay? Once we're able to do that, they start to become open to our suggestions on how we can actually solve their problems. Now, what do we find most 
business owners are or salespeople are, we call them product pushers. Okay, they think they can ask maybe a few questions or write some cool copy or say their product is the latest, greatest, this or that. And they think that they can go into that sales pitch talking about the features. And this could be in your ads too, features and benefits of the product and service and how they have the best this and buy it and the best that, which by the way, how many companies do we know of or salespeople that have tried to sell us something that said their product and service is the best? That's everybody. Everybody says that. Okay. So when we say those type of things, it's almost like your prospects psychologically trust us less because they're used to everybody saying that. It's like if you watch The Bachelor and the host comes on, my wife makes me watch The Bachelor every Monday night, and the host comes on like, this is the most dramatic season of all time and the craziest season of all time. Well, they've said that 22 years straight. So at this point, it's like you don't believe them. You're like, oh, come on, man. You guys have said that 20 years straight. Like, give me a break. And that's like taking a bucket of mud and like throwing it up against the wall hoping and praying that something we're going to say in our ads or hoping and praying something our salespeople are going to say is just going to magically, you know, trigger the prospect to just, you know, open up their wallets and buy. Okay. So we, I call that hopium. It's a drug that so many entrepreneurs and salespeople are on where they just hope and pray something they're going to say in their ads or on the phone is just going to magically make that person want to do something. And it's a hard and very unpredictable way to make a living for sure. And, and it's so true. I mean, Gosh, there's been so many products that I've even sold myself where that's what I do is I just spray and pray, right? I, I throw it up there and I hope that it sticks and I hope that people buy it. And I'm like, you know, I'm not thinking about what that problem solves. I'm not thinking about either fixing a problem or making something better. And I'm already thinking about some of the most, um, I don't know, interesting brands that I've been watching. One of them is called Solo Stove. Right, I got one for Christmas. I don't know if you've seen this thing, but it's basically a stainless steel fire pit. That's all it is. And it's like $300. It's ridiculously expensive. But when I think about why I bought it, I bought it not because I wanted a fire pit that I can have in my back deck. If you look at all the marketing, it's showing family time, right? It's either showing like the parents with their kids roasting a marshmallow on the back deck. So it's it's selling the idea of togetherness or their copy and, and ads and all that are selling the idea of cool. Like it shows the guys sitting around a, a campfire, you know, at the fishing lake and like you're showing off to your buddies. This is my really cool man. Toy, you see right? what emotional needs that solving is solving yep. the emotional need of family time. It's showing the emotional need of like togetherness with friends, reconnecting. That's what it's solving. That's what sold you. Not that yeah, and I've, never really thought, I've never really thought about that. Yeah. But if I look at some of these really successful brands recently, that's what they're doing is they're convincing me I need it, not because I need it, because I need the results of it. And I, yeah, you're hundred percent right. Like so, so many, so many people, you know, like uh, even in e-commerce, it doesn't really matter, you know, think that, Hey, I'm just, I'm selling this product. No, you're not selling a product. You're not selling the service. You're selling the results of what that product or service does for them. Like you're not selling the thing. You're like you said, you're selling the results of what that thing does for them. And once you get that in your mind, selling becomes really easy. I'm writing this down. We don't sell a thing. We sell a result. I do this all the time. <laughs> you're just selling the results of what that thing does for the client. You're not, you're never selling the thing. Like if you're, I mean, I know your audience is not like, let's say you're a real estate agent. You're not selling the home. You're selling the results of what that home does. Maybe they want to be in a safe neighborhood. Let's say if you sold insurance, I'm just giving you random examples. You're not selling the insurance policy. You're selling them the financial protection. So when he passes away, his family's taken care of. That's what you're selling. You're not selling the Lambo. You're selling the results of that feeling the driver's going to get when he cruises by in his neighborhood and everybody watches him. That's what you're selling. You're selling the results of what those things does for the client. And it's amazing. I'm going through like catalog lists right now, and this can apply to a $5 item and a half a million dollars Lambo. It, it, it is universal and I love it. So I'm sold, right? Again, I'm sold. I'm buying what you're selling, man. But what are some of the biggest mistakes to be made? Because maybe our listeners are thinking, all right, I get it. I'm going to start working on this. Like I understand I have to sell better. I have to be a little more psychologically savvy. I have to be more tactical and I'm going to know pointed in the direction that we're moving in and the way they're trying to sell. But now that I'm convinced that I need to be doing this, what are some of the biggest mistakes people make in trying? Yeah, to I think one of the biggest mistakes that entrepreneurs and salespeople make when they're trying to sell something. And like I said, that can come across in your ads or your brand or your individual salespeople that are selling your products or service is they come across way too excited and enthusiastic about what they sell 
And then they try to talk about their solution way too early in the conversation. Now, do I mean be boring? No, but they come across way too excited. Okay. Now, when I say that events, people are like, no, I've, I've been taught that I have to be excited about what I sell. Right. Like if I'm excited that somehow they're going to get excited as well and just think it's important because I'm excited about it. But nothing can be further from the truth. According to behavioral science, human psychology, completely the data shows something completely different the way our brains are wired. Now, do I mean be excited about what you do? Yes. But you have to keep that to yourself. You have to keep that internal. We have to get rid of what I call commission breath. It's the worst breath ever. Like you got to start brushing your teeth. All right. And here's what we have to understand. And this is probably the same in ads and marketing, but especially if you have a sales team and they get on the phone or on zoom or in a person, let's say you're an entrepreneur and you own an e-commerce business and you have a meeting where you're trying to convince somebody, a supplier or something to do something for you. Here's what we have to understand. Human behavior 101 within the first seven to 12 seconds of any sales interaction you're involved in your prospects are subconsciously picking up on social cues from you, okay? Subconsciously, we can't even help it. It's the way our brains are wired as human beings. They're picking up on our verbal and nonverbal cues from our tonality and what we are saying and or asking that triggers their brain to react in one of two ways, okay? Now, if we come across, let's say in that ad, or we come across on a sales call, let's say you got a sales team, if we come across aggressive, if we come across needy, like we need the sale, we're attached and we don't know the right questions to ask, it actually triggers the brain of your prospect to go into what we call fight or flight mode. Now, everybody's heard of fight or flight, but unless you've kind of really gone into human psychology, a lot of people don't know what it means or how is it triggered, okay? And that's where, you know, if you've got salespeople on a call, the, the prospect tries to get rid of them real quick, like, hey, can, can, can you just send me a quote? Uh, uh, hey, I, I'm, I'm busy. Can you just call me back later? Or, you know what? We're good. We already have somebody for that. Like, we don't need that. We don't have the money for that. Can you call me back a week, a month? Can you just send me a proposal? Can you just send me a quote? Okay. That's because we triggered fight or flight mode by something we've said or didn't ask. Now, on the flip side, once we learn how to work with human behavior in our sales process, if we come across more neutral, like we're not biased, we're not sure if we can even help yet. We don't know enough about their situation. If we come across more calm, like relaxed, and especially, here's the key word, detached. If we come across detached and we know the right questions to ask, it triggers their brain to become curious enough where they feel like they want to engage. They want to open up to us because they feel like we might have something very important for them. So we have to learn, especially if you have salespeople, we have to learn how to get them to come across more detached from the expectations of making the sale and really focus on whether or not this, there's a sale to be made in the first place, whether or not they have problems that you can actually solve. Now, like I said, if you got a sales team, do, or let's say if you're an entrepreneur and you're in a meeting trying to persuade somebody, do I mean that you shouldn't try to do that? Hell no, you should try to do that on every single call, but you have to keep that to yourself because the moment they feel that you are trying to sell them is the moment they do what? They start to emotionally shut down. That's one of the biggest mistakes that sellers and entrepreneurs make. So much to, uh, to think about and to ponder, to apply. Um, you know, I started off with this podcast thinking that we were going to talk about the business side of things. Uh, and, and you're right, you know, the, the being able to sell partners and strategic, even uh, contractors and manufacturers is important, but transferring all that into our ad copy, our packaging, the images, no matter where we sell, what we sell, we are selling and those truths apply. And sometimes we forget that we oversimplify yeah. and we probably miss a lot of big opportunities. I mean, if you're trying to recruit some big employee for you, what are you doing? Yep. You're trying to persuade your influence. You're trying to move others. I mean, we have to learn these skills if we want to keep up. Uh, with people that are learning them, because there's people out there, I hate to tell everybody, but that are learning these skills right now. And you, without those skills, compared to somebody who has those skills, what do you think is going to come out on top? Exactly. I love it. So if our listeners do not want to get left behind and want to come out on top, I'm sure that you have some more information that can be shared. I know that you've got a lot of free content community at salesrevolution.group, right? That's a free Facebook. Yeah. Group yeah. If they want to go learn some of those details, because we, we even have a lot of people, like I said, we even have a lot of e-commerce clients that we, you know, we hire and train their salespeople for them. We actually manage our salespeople, big, big, huge people you guys have heard about in the e-commerce space as well, but every industry, if they want to learn more details, get some free resources, just have them go to like, I said, salesrevolution.group, 
right when they join, it's like a quick two question survey. So we know what industry they're in and like what type of products or service just tracks our data in there. And then right when they join, somebody on my team will message them a free training called the NEPQ 101 mini course. And there's a list of different questions they can ask for different sales situations, all the way from recruiting to negotiating to actual sales calls for your salespeople if you have a sales team. And we just give that for every person that joins like a free 45 minute training they just have for free. We go live in that Facebook group about three to four times a day with different trainings, different Q and A's, uh, different subject matter. So yeah, people, people, people really like that for sure. So they're welcome to join that. Yeah. And you've got your own podcast, right? I do. Yeah. Closers of losers. We have about, uh, we started about six, seven months ago. We've got about 20,000, um, uh, downloads a month on there. Uh, we're growing that sucker and we just, you know, uh, Matt, uh, Ryder is my is our CEO of the company, my business partner, and uh, we typically go over different subject matters all the way to how to run a business, how to manage salespeople, all the way to individual like what to actually have your salespeople say on sales calls. So uh, they can always go to that too. But salesrevolution.group is where they're going to get the most value for sure. Got it. Love it. Well, I appreciate you being on. I know that you've got a lot of stuff going on. You've got a lot of content that you've been putting out and meeting a lot of really cool folks, getting involved in a lot of cool communities. So I appreciate you taking the time to come and share some of this wisdom with our audience. Uh, again, any of you that are listening, make sure to go to salesrevolution.group and check out that free information. And make sure if you found some value in this podcast episode, leave us a review on whatever pl- uh, podcast platform you're listening on. Leave us a review. Let us know what you think. And of course, that shows us some love, gets this little ranking juice, which we always appreciate. Uh, Jeremy, any other final words before we uh, wrap this you up? Know, my final thought, and because I, you know, I do a lot of these podcasts each week, and they always ask me the same question. What's your final thoughts? Okay. Final thoughts, it, it, I want you to, to, we talked a little bit about it. All selling is, and it doesn't matter if it's branding, if it's marketing, if it's sales, doesn't matter. All selling is, all branding is, is about one thing only. If I could describe it in one word, it's about change. That's all sales is. That's all persuasion is, is change in one word. It's about how good you are at getting your prospect to view in their mind that by changing their situation, means purchasing your product or service, that them doing that is far less risky for them than them doing nothing at all, staying in the status quo, their problems stay the same, and nothing ever changes, which is more risky. So sales, all about change. That's my final thought. Love it. Great thought to end on. Thank you all for listening to this episode. We'll see you next week.